what was it kind of like to elaborate a little bit more about like I guess your typical day in the week when you're doing school, trying to balance school, your exams, your um, um, your assignments, and then your training as well. Yeah, so for me, what helped the most was an agenda. Like, I could not live without it because I really had to, like, I every, before every week, like, I always had all my assignments, all my deadlines put in, but I also have, like, my badminton tournament so that every time I'm looking through it, I have an idea of, like, what's to come. And mm -hmm. then that would make it easier to schedule, like, my daily activity. So I always put, like, from this time to this time, I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. And this time I'm doing that, I'm like studying. And from this time I'm going to training. Mm -hmm. And I'll always schedule in like a short nap time just to like recharge. Mm -hmm. Just because like my days are so long. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, definitely just like making a schedule and setting goals is what really helped me through that period. Mm -hmm. And you also have to like actually actively schedule and studying time and homework time. I did because it helped me just get into it because I feel like if I were like, oh, yeah, I'll study later, then mm -hmm. if I don't set a time, it, I kind of procrastinate. Mm -hmm. So by me telling me like at six o'clock, like I need to start studying, like mm -hmm. I just, I just do it. Okay. Yeah. That is super, super crazy, but a lot of dedication to like both the student life and the athlete life. So yeah, I think it's just because to <laughs> me, I valued both a lot. Like I mm -hmm. valued my education and I valued Bampton a lot. Okay. And I couldn't really, at that time, I couldn't really be like, one is more important than the other. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Did you ever come across a point, though, where they both, like, something happened simultaneously in both your Bampton life and your school life, and you had to kind of compromise? And oh, so many times. But I think the biggest <laughs> one was... So I start, so I'm a January baby, so I start school early. Okay. So in my first year of university, I qualified mm -hmm. for my first World Juniors. Mm -hmm. And that was during September and October. Okay. No, October, November, sorry. Okay. And that was during, it was during midterm week. So I was missing two weeks of school for World Juniors. It's, it's a big deal because it's my first World Juniors, but at the same time, it's my first year of university. And the yeah. week that I was missing was exactly midterm week. Mm. So... Yeah, and I think that was the time where I was like, I really want to play World Juniors. It's my first mm -hmm. one. Could be my last. Like, I, I wouldn't know. So yeah. I ended up having three, two or three 80% finals in my first year of university. Oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they said I couldn't defer it. I, the weight just transferred onto my mm -hmm. final. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is insane. You must have gone through so much stress going into that final being like, this is worth 80%. Yeah, you, you know, you know, <laughs> that was such a stressful first year. I can see it on your face. I was like, you had that flashback moment. You're like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, tears, tears are definitely shed. I was so stressed. Oh my gosh. Yeah. A cur question out of curiosity. You said um, going to that tournament was a really big, uh, big six, like a, I guess like a big what's called I'm, I'm at a loss for words a big moment in your life did your profs ever share that type of sentiment to you towards you as like an athlete no I think because then I wasn't I wasn't part of the national team then because mm -hmm. I was still a junior okay. so they were kind of like some profs were okay with it but some mm -hmm. profs were like oh like you're in school like shouldn't you think like they're like school's more important to you like, if yeah. you think badminton's more important, then you should just stop, like, not go to school right now. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Now, do you think they said that because they actually meant it because it was school versus sport? Or do you think it would be more so because of school versus badminton? Because I think a lot of us that play badminton understand that not very many people play and it's not mm -hmm. very popular sport in comparison mm -hmm. to, like, basketball or like volleyball or like mm -hmm. things like that where you could actually get like a full scholarship like a university for type of thing. Mm -hmm. I think it was just the just sport in general mm -hmm. just because like back then as a junior there's not very much like it's not like now where I can be like I'm on a national team so mm -hmm. whatever I do actually matters mm -hmm. like you don't have that like title like but even before I made like deferring exams hard before I made the national team it was always like oh I have to I have to play this tournament but they'd be like, oh, why do you have to? Like, mm -hmm. what, do you, what does it go towards? I and I can't really answer that. So, oh, I see. yeah, that was difficult. Yeah, so I think it's just sport in general. Mm 
but definitely yeah maybe because it's Bampton it's not as popular they're like oh are there even Bampton tournaments yeah (laughs) yeah I can see that but it's interesting it's like when you joined um when you got to join the Canadian team for badminton that was pretty much like your doctor's note yeah actually yeah yeah. and the funny thing is I actually didn't even know that we even had a national team like I got the invitation and Mm -hmm. I didn't even know were you like is this fake like you know how like the <laughs> no, it was an email. So I, I was just, I was oh. like, I just, I just like, I couldn't comprehend what was happening, and I had to research, and yeah, because they didn't at that time they didn't advertise it, like they didn't okay. kind of market the team very mm-hmm. much. So I like, I didn't know who was even on it, and there was even one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not gonna lie, I'm totally on that same boat. I like before Michelle Lee, I didn't even really know Canva since badminton players for the olympics yeah we have a team yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah you're not the only one (laughs) it was really exciting it was kind of like being like reborn into the badminton world for the first time and i was like oh this is so cool (laughs) yeah yeah it's just like yeah because they didn't bark at them like no one knew so yeah yeah yeah. i I, I don't know. I don't have any experience on this topic, but it just doesn't mm-hmm. seem like there's as much funding in terms of badminton. Uh, yeah, I think before it was even less, but since Michelle and Alex Booth got fourth at the, I think it was the 2012 London Olympics, there was a controversy. So some teams were kind of banned. And so they're able to take fourth place. And after that, we've gotten a lot more funding. Like, not enough to cover everything, but we've definitely got a lot more funding than, yeah, just for the national team. That's great. Yeah, but it's it sucks because, like, even amongst the national team, not everyone's funded. Oh. Yeah, so, like, there's a committee that kind of votes for you, and I think initially we only had six of the nine of us funded. Mm-hmm. But I think starting from last year was the first time that every single national team member got funding. Oh, that's crazy. That's yeah. Crazy. Yeah. But just imagine, like, how long, like, for other national team members, like, yeah. if they didn't get any funding at all, I can't imagine mm-hmm. the struggle of trying to make ends meet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. From what I understand, is you guys cover your expenses independently, right? Yes. Everything mm-hmm. on our own. Mm-hmm. So that yeah. includes, um, like, your, what, like, your traveling, your accommodation, food, tournament costs. Like yeah, so some for some turns we have to even pay for our own tournament like yeah. entry fee. Oh my god! And even as a junior, we had to pay for our own like clothing. So like for like the junior Pan Ams, yeah, yeah, we were selected, mm-hmm. and then we have like they give us uh, team uniforms, mm-hmm. and we have to wear them. But yet we we have to pay for them out of our own pocket. Oh, which is, like to me it seemed ridiculous. Like even like. The fact that you get selected for something, mm-hmm. but yet you pay for your whole way there, mm-hmm. and you have to pay for the clothing that you you have to wear at that tournament. Yeah, yeah. It's so kind no, of like winning the lottery, but then you find out you have to pay for the money they give you. Exactly, it's almost like you're paying more than what you're mm-hmm. you're getting. Yeah, so I think that was such a struggle for me as a kid growing up, just because like I didn't come from a like like I don't want to say rich, but like. I mean, I grew up in an average household, mm-hmm. but like all these expenses just piled up. Yeah, yeah, I could imagine. That's yeah. Insane. So, is it better now, like in terms of expenses, because you're still competing, but you got a bit more funding? So, does it feel like a li- has it helped you at all now? Oh yeah, for sure. So mm-hmm. I started a GoFundMe last year mm-hmm. because, like, with the Olympic qualifications, I'm playing virtually like double, double the amount of tournaments I normally played. Mm-hmm. and I'm also mm-hmm. going farther away and for like longer duration so I can't coach so before I would coach in order to like make up for some of that cost but because I wasn't coaching I had no income and it was just based on like my prize money and yeah and my funding and so the GoFundMe definitely helped me a lot and then mm-hmm. we were lucky to get a sponsor okay. uh, from Hong Kong so he also like helped us out and just like lifted mm-hmm. like this whole like, whole weight off our shoulders that's so good. Yeah. Because before we had to like number crunch, like everything we had to like, what's the cheapest alternative? Can we afford to like, we're just more planning. Like when you go to a tournament and 
you pay like they have these like a deal so the term will have a deal with the hotel so you pay like a higher price but you get like breakfast included you get transportation included from the airport transportation included from the hotel to the badminton hall but like for us like some of it was too expensive so we had to stay at the airbnb but mm-hmm. have to figure out everything on our own. So we have to figure out how to get from the airport to our place mm-hmm. and then how to get from our place to the tournament hall. Mm-hmm. And sometimes some tournaments, they have a different practice hall and tournament hall. So that's like another location they have to figure out how to get to. Okay. Yeah, and like Malaysia, the practice hall was like an hour drive away from the hotel. So like imagine if like, where would you even stay? Yeah. Like you're spending so much money. Yeah. yeah. So like, like the... Like the practice hall and the tournament hall, like were they usually like far apart ish? Like they weren't like side by side? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it depends on the place. Mm-hmm. So usually what happens is like a tournament hall will have practice courts, but those, those are only for players who are getting ready for their match. Okay. Yeah, and the practice hall would be a separate venue because there's so many players there. Yeah. And like, yeah, so many players and they have to accommodate for everyone and the, mm-hmm. the amount of countries, they usually need to book a separate practice hall mm-hmm. like a hall just for people to train when they're not playing that day or they're playing that uh, late at night and they need a place to train in the morning mm-hmm. yeah so yeah. And they can be like usually like right next to each other like a complex but sometimes yeah. they're like sometimes like 20 30 minute drive away mm. sounds yeah. like you would have benefited from an rv if anything yeah yeah yeah, so definitely because of all the, the funding and support I got last year, I was able to just kind of like, oh, I can afford to stay at the term hotel and just not worry about anything and just focus on my playing. Okay, that's yeah. good. So with the funding, has it also have you been also been able to play more games and kind of like have more diversity like on the international platform and things like that just because yeah. you have more wiggle room? Yeah, I think... Uh, I guess I get more choice on what I want to play rather mm-hmm. than be like, oh, I have no choice. Like, I'll just... So, like, usually how it works is that tournaments have... Um, they'll have back-to-back tournaments around the same area. So, like, they'll have an Asia tour. So, you have, like, three back-to-back tournaments in Asia. Mm-hmm. But then, at the same time, they'll have, say, like, a European tour going on or mm-hmm. in Australia, they'll have some, like, back-to-back tournaments. So, mm-hmm. whereas, like, before, we'd be like, oh, we have to just stay in Asia and just do those three tournaments. Now we have, like oh, maybe we can just go fly down to Australia because it's in the same time zone. Uh, like, yeah, it's more money, but, like, maybe we need that kind of play, like, a lower-level tournament just to, like, boost our confidence mm-hmm. before, like, going back, yeah. Mm-hmm. So now we have that, I guess, choice, and that makes it a lot easier. Okay. Yeah. So you're, like, country hopping pretty much to play, like, these tournaments in the past. Yeah, it's very strategic because, like, with Olympic qualification, um... Mm-hmm. It all depends. Like, it's just luck of a draw. Like, who enters the same tournament as you? Okay. Right? So you really have to be strategic in terms of, like, what's going on at the same time? Mm-hmm. What do you think these players are playing? What should mm-hmm. I play instead? Yeah. So with that being said, if you're, like, country hopping, do you usually prefer to stay in the same time zone so you don't get that extreme jet lag? Or do you not really have choice? Uh, yeah, preferably definitely the same time zone. Because jet lag takes such a huge toll on us and mm. there's usually not that many days in between tournaments yeah. so it's it's really hard yeah, yeah. i could like I, I could picture you just landing if it was like a completely different different time zone like let's say asia to like south america and trying to recover like, the next yeah <laughs> i think the worst was uh in august of last year mm-hmm. i went so from edmonton i went to uh peru Okay. And then from per- I was in Peru for two weeks for the Pan Am Games, and I had to fly to India oh my God. for a tournament. So it's How across- long was that I think it took me almost two days to get there, like a day and a half of just traveling. It was oh it was God. so awful because I got sick in Peru because they didn't have heaters in the room. Okay. And it was basically like their winter then. It was so cold. Oh yeah, and yeah, we only had one blanket, so we all got sick basically and I had to fly to India and India wasn't that great either but after India I had to fly to Bulgaria oh my God. and Bulgaria to Switzerland so the Bulga- Bulgaria to Switzerland wasn't that big of a change but just like that transition from like like that time zone difference and then having to go back home yeah. for six days and then flying back to Asia again for mm-hmm. like another Asia tour was my body felt so 
bad. Yeah. <laughs> I was just constantly tired. Your internal clock must have been like, what are you doing? Yeah, I had none. It was just, it was a mess. Oh my, in Peru and then to India, it's like you're going more from like the Southern Hemisphere, like to the North. So it's like you're going to like extreme cold to like yeah. super hot. Yeah, it was, it was not fun. Like even just packing is so hard. Like you're supposed to pack your whole, like the one month in one suitcase, but yet you're going through like four different seasons. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how do you do that? Like. You just have to bring, like, one piece, I guess, of, like, everything? Uh, we do a lot of laundry. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, like, I think okay. outerwear is probably the most important thing. Mm-hmm. But, like, usually just, like, yeah, it's, it's just hard. We Like, mm-hmm. even finding laundry is, like, to do is so hard. Because some of these hotels charge, like, $4 to wash one sock. Not even a pair oh, of socks. God. One sock. Like it's ridiculous. Or like one no, one sock. And then oh. to wash one shirt is like I've seen like twelve dollars. Oh my god. It's so crazy. So we have to hand wash. So I bring detergent with me and I just hand wash it in like the tub. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's poor, it's so awful. Yeah. Your poor hands. Your poor like I've done that once and I got like like it like my skin started ripping. Like did that ever yeah. happen to you? Yeah, it's yeah. Oh. And, and the, I think the one of the hardest part too was just like mm-hmm. because there's a rule that you can't wear the same color shirt as your opponent, okay. and the higher ranked team gets like precedent basically. Oh, so Lord. if we have to like wear the same shirt back to back days, like if it doesn't dry in time, yeah, it's it's so gross. Oh my god! <laughs> I know. Yeah, these are just some things that people like. Just kind of like a day in the life of a yeah. badminton athlete on tour. Dang. Wait, question. Speaking about like the things that don't dry. So if you're in a very humid area and you're playing, mm-hmm. your shoes get very moist and warm from playing. Do they dry? Yeah. Uh, we always have to like air it out. So like after we play, we just like, instead of putting it in your bag, because that's mm-hmm. just going to collect moisture, you just like leave it out. And then when you get back to wherever, like our mm-hmm. accommodation, we just like let it out and dry. Okay. Yeah. And no, it's so gross. Shoes are always the worst, especially like the deeper in you go, like the yeah. more like wet and squishy. Oh my god! Yeah. People up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so and, and then talking about like like that's so cool to hear about like your whole journey so far, especially now on your road to the Olympics. So, can you tell us a little bit more about like the specifics on how you're um, supposed to? kind of get there and how you qualify to get there just because I know you have to play tournaments to get there but like mm-hmm. are, what are the other specific details like and kind of are included in that yeah so for Olympics uh, for mixed doubles specifically they take only 16 teams okay so they take the top rank 16 teams and mm-hmm. how your rank is determined is by your top 10 best tournaments okay but there's a rule that says you can each country can only send one team Mm-hmm. unless you have two teams uh, from the same country in the top eight. So if China has uh, two teams in top eight, they can send both teams, even though the rule okay. says you can only send one. But what if they have, like, three teams in the top eight? So they only take the top two. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so then there's also a continental rule where uh, at the Olympics, every single continent has to be represented. So that means one from Europe, one from Asia, mm-hmm. Africa, uh, mm-hmm. Pan America, which mm-hmm. is what our region is called in North and South uh, America. So right yeah. now we're in the 14th spot and we're also the highest Pan American team. Yeah, yeah. so we're kind of, yeah. Yeah, so we kind of have that Pan, like temporary, we have the t- Pan American spot because we're the highest Pan American mm-hmm. team. But I think, like, rank-wise, we're also... I think we're just, like, one spot off from qualifying, like, outright by rank. Okay. Yeah. So, if you were... The, if you were still the first spot, uh, first team for the Pan-American spot, mm-hmm. but then you were, like, let's say, ranked, like, 15, and they, but they didn't have anyone representing, like, our continent, like, what mm-hmm. would happen? They would bump us up. They take okay. off whoever was, like, ranked. Yeah, so basically how it works is that they look at the top 16 teams and they're, like, so after they filtered out all the double-up countries, they're, like, okay, okay, is the Pan-American region represented? And if the answer okay. is no, 
uh, oh, there's also a rule that you have to be within top 50 rank in order to use the continental rule. So say, so uh, they'll be like, okay, so in the top 16, is the Pan American region represented? If the answer is no, are there any Pan American teams within the top 50? If yes, then they okay. take that highest rank and then they would take off the rank 16 and replace it with us. And then they'll do, they'll oh, okay. do the same with like Africa region and Oceania region, which is like Australia, New Zealand. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I see. So you're yeah. in a really good position. So even if, like, by chance, hopefully not, you, like, mm-hmm. um, drop below, like, the 15th or 16th rank, you, and it's, like, you kept your first spot for the Pan Am. Like, you could still, yeah. like, you could qualify to go to the Olympics. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's really exciting. Yeah. So when do you have until, I guess, like, when is the date that you would know by? Like, because I'm assuming you still have a few more tournaments to be eligible to play in until the next yeah. Olympics. Yeah, so originally when the Olympics was not cancelled or like mm. postponed, we were mm. supposed to play, or the season was supposed to end April 2020. So we would know mm. then, but because mm. all the tournaments from March and April were cancelled, mm. so now the new qualification uh, end date is April 2021. Okay. And so all the tournaments are cancelled this year mm-hmm. in March and April, they're just going to count uh, the same tournaments next year towards our Olympic rank. So we keep whatever we got. Mm-hmm. We add the March and April tournaments of next year into our oh. qualification points. Yeah. Okay. So even if you had other tournaments you could hypothetically play earlier on, like let's say they start playing again in like January or December or whatnot, mm-hmm. like those wouldn't count towards your Olympic qual. No, they wouldn't count. Only the okay. ones in March and April. So only the ones that were cancelled are the only ones that count. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see. I see. Yeah. So how many, how many games would that be, do you know, like roughly? Uh, well, we get to choose how many we get to play, but I yeah. think we have five. So of the eight weeks, mm-hmm. we have five of them that mm-hmm. we're planning to play. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it, it might not make a difference because, like, if – we don't do better than what we like what we already have like points wise yeah. then it won't change our rank okay yeah so it could and it might not change might make a huge yeah. difference yeah but it, like if you decided to sit out for those two months could it change your rank potentially uh depends on how the our opponents like the people around our rank do i guess mm-hmm. okay. yeah so let's say I'm really hoping you guys get into Olympics because that'd be really cool, really exciting for you. Yeah. Uh, are there any preparations you already know that you kind of have to make to go to the Olympics in terms of like either training or like um, paperwork or like, like, I don't know, like mental preparation or anything like that? Yeah, so Bam Jikana actually arranged for a training camp for us in uh, a place called Hakodate in Japan mm-hmm. for the people that do make Olympics. So we'll do, oh. like, um, just to kind of, like, acclimatize and adjust to, like, time zone stuff before we actually uh-huh. go into the village. Okay. Yeah, so that's the more definitive piece. Uh, mm-hmm. Everything else is, because of the pandemic, it's kind of up in the air. Like, we, yeah. we've discussed with the other Canadian teams that we were planning to just like all come together and train together for a little bit too. Mm-hmm. So that might mean for me to move to Toronto for a bit. Okay. Yeah. It would be so fun. I love Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> you might be different, but it is fun. And I don't know, it's like, you know, preparation. But that would be yeah. even like, it would be like you'd be flying one way, but then you'd have to be flying the other way after. Yeah, but just because, like, everyone who's probably going to make the Olympics are from Toronto, like, it's just, mm-hmm. yeah, it just makes things easier. Fair. Yeah. Fair. It's totally fair. And I guess it'd be a lot more fun, too, doing, like, a long-distance flight with, like, your teammates and not by yourself, like, I'll meet you there. Yeah, like, oh, man, yeah. Flying alone is not fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are, you, are you excited or scared to start flying again? I'm definitely scared. Like, we're supposed to play the Thomas Uber Cup uh, in October, second week of October. Mm. And Mm. according to the tournament officials, it's still going on, which is scary to me Mm -hmm. because I'm not sure. Because they made it a rule where they waive uh, quarantine for everyone. So no one who's attending the tournament Mm -hmm. has to self-quarantine for two weeks. Mm -hmm. No one, not a single person. 
and that mm-hmm. to me is a little bit concerning so i'm a little bit scared yeah yeah it's just like there's yeah. no there's no rush in a way because none of these tournaments count for mm-hmm. olympics mm-hmm. but it's just like everyone's also kind of wanting to get back out on that you know on the field and playing again so yeah yeah, yeah. i think a lot of people could echo your sentiments especially since this is more like your job type of thing like i think lots of people in general just want to go back to like work socialize like more kind of like normal type of lifestyle you know you yeah know, like, yeah i think the quarantine car this like lockdown kind of drove everyone a little bit crazy so Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. and not being able to exercise too like that's like a whole different ball game. yeah exactly mm-hmm. anyways i think that is well just we thank you for sharing all your information with us and your insight and your experience and all your fun stories um i think that's all we will have time for today and i don't want to keep you too long either just because i think we've, <laughs> we've reached the one hour mark <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, before we kind of come to an end to the podcast, I just I have a little like Q&A, a fun little Q&A section for you to kind of go through. Um, so I kind of have two. So one is more kind of, uh, like short answer. And then uh, and then the other one's more kind of like, it's kind of like, would you rather pick this one or like this one? Type mm-hmm. thing? Okay, so I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um the first one is what is your favorite indulgent food ice cream oh ice cream where's your favorite ice cream place in edmonton there's one correct answer i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> kind of um in edmonton i guess i don't know I, i'm i'm more of a village fan in calgary actually really okay. yeah i love village Wait, have you tried Made by Marcus yet? I have. I'm still a village like fan. Him? What? Okay. <laughs> I, I will accept that answer. Have you tried Yellow yet in Edmonton? I also have. And you still like Village? I'm an ice cream enthusiast, but I, I stand by Village. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. Shout out marketing to Village. Good job, uh, Village. <laughs> <laughs> All that. Um, have, ew. Random question though: Have you tried the um that one Marcus's favorite whatever I can't remember what it is? It has like like five different flavors in it. No. And, okay, yeah. What's your favorite? <laughs> Please don't say vanilla. Your favorite's vanilla, isn't it? For what ice cream flavor? <laughs> oh no no like that made by or that village sorry. Oh no Earl Grey, the Earl Grey is so good. You're one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> You're the people like. Right. And I'm like, oh my god, what are you gonna get? There's like, like these seasonal flavors and all these. Oh, I have seasonal things. too. Okay, okay. But Earl Grey is like, I usually get like two kids scoop instead of okay. like just like one true. like uh, yeah. True, true. But the and Earl you get Grey the- is a huh? like, sorry. No, I was gonna ask if you get the waffle cone. Oh, of course, it's made in house. It's so good. I think it's the only place that I get a waffle cone. I don't get waffle cones anywhere else. Really? Yeah, because I don't. I'm not a fan of cones, but the oh. one at Village is actually. Dare I say life changing? Oh my gosh. They better okay. sponsor big, me after this. <laughs> <laughs> big words. And people will see the video and they try the waffle cone from Village and they don't like it. I just want to say we are, it is not advertised by you. <laughs> so please don't come yell at us. But yeah, you were going to say something else about your double kid scoop. Oh, yeah. I just always get Earl Grey and then I'll get a seasonal usually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were saying, like, you get two kids scoop of the Earl Grey. And I was like, why no. would you make No, that? no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Village. Okay, fair. I accept that we have different in ice cream taste, but that's totally fine. <laughs> okay, so I do know that you have traveled a lot for your tournament. So if you could mm-hmm. live anywhere for one year, all expenses paid, where would you live? And more for, I'm, like, your Sorry. Uh, probably either... Adelaide, Australia, or Vienna, Austria. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because just this Adelaide's just so similar to Canada, and then Vienna's just, I think, one of the nicest European cities I've ever been to. Mm-hmm. And good street dogs. Like, have you tried the street dogs with a cheese? Yeah. <laughs> and they're so massive. They're I know. So good. I know. Yeah. 
Um, okay, next question. Okay, oh, this next section is more kind of um, uh, pick one or the other. Okay. Mm -hmm. So first one, Yonix or Victor? Yonix. Shout out to my sponsor. <laughs> my real sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> um, women's doubles or singles? Oh. Oh, but women's doubles. Women's doubles? Okay. Okay. There was a bit of hesitation there. You well, feel like I was like, <laughs> I was like, there's less running in uh, women's doubles, but then singles feels, you get more satisfaction when you play a good singles game. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it be faster sometimes, and it just because you are by yourself, so you're like, oh my god, oh my god. And you get to control things in singles too. Like I like the idea of like <laughs> you're in, yeah, you control your fate basically. <laughs> True. That is so deep, but very accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, would you rather play an early morning game at like 7 or 8 a.m. or like a late night game, like 9, 10 p.m.? For sure, early morning game. Okay. Mm you don't like it cutting into your nighttime sleep? Like you're more of a morning I get, person? I get so tired. Okay. Like, no NAS will save me from like an 8, like 9, 10 p.m. game. Fair, yeah. fair. Um, would you rather have no time to eat during your games or have to play right after you eat? No time to eat between games. Mm, yeah. Cramping is always a problem for sports. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you rather play a home game, so like anywhere within Canada, or an away game anywhere outside of the country? Definitely in Canada, home game. Is it true like there's such thing as like home court advantage, or is that a mental thing? Um, I think so, because for one, like you're more acclimatize like yeah you're playing in the stadium but like just like external factors like say if I grew up playing in like in Canada it's like colder so a lot of people take longer to warm up but for me it's kind of normal mm -hmm. but also like just having people cheer for you is makes to me at least it makes a huge difference mm, right yeah. so it's close they can have more family and friends and stuff come to or just you. it's just nice to have people cheer you on like when you go to these tournaments like no one really cheers like everyone cheers for their own like home mm -hmm. home team so mm -hmm. yeah it must have been nice for you in peru then if you like the cheering and it seemed like they were very enthusiastic like uh yeah they're like a bit sometimes it gets a bit much like i remember going yeah. to indonesia where they were so loud that i couldn't even hear my shuttle hitting <laughs> like i could not hear the shuttle so because like usually like, when we do full work like we time oh, yeah. we time our split step with the yeah. our with our opponent hitting the shuttle, but mm -hmm. because I couldn't hear it, it was just all visual. But like you have like you're in a huge stadium with oh, yeah. like your backdrops with like hundreds of people. Oh my gosh! Yeah, that is funny. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I couldn't even hear my own voice. Like Josh would try to say something to me, like a tactical. I'm like I can't, I can't hear anything. Pick up sign language. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Could you even hear like the umpire or anything? Like, saying no. Anything? So, good oh. thing there's a screen uh, usually in the back uh, telling us what the score is. Because sometimes, okay. like, if we're like, I tend to forget the score. Oh, yeah. So, like, fair. luckily there's like a screen that says, like, if I couldn't hear the umpire, I would just like look back and, like, oh, okay, that's what the <laughs> score is. Oh, fair. That is so funny. That is so yeah. funny. Okay, and last but not least, uh, what is one piece of advice you'd give to people trying to become more competitive in badminton? Mm, I think I would tell them to just not be afraid. Like, definitely not be afraid of what other people say. And just, like, remember that you're just doing it for yourself. You do it because you enjoy mm -hmm. it. And just, like, really just embody that. Like, yeah. like, don't be too focused on results. Just focus on, like, your own personal development and yeah and have fun yeah have exactly fun too. like just remember to have fun yeah because i mean like we do like we do things because we enjoy it so like we don't have fun when we don't enjoy it so just like rather than just focusing on like winning and losing or like just focus like oh did i improve like did i do this better than last time mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. awesome well thank you so much josephine for all like that extra information as well and for taking time to show um, up here on our podcast and because I know it's been kind of chaotic for in terms of like technology wise for both of us trying to get this up and running type of thing yeah thanks for having me Shirley
Yeah, no worries. And thank you to all our listeners and slash viewers as well. Now that we have it in video mode, I hope, I hope this works out in video <laughs> mode. Um, and so if you want to continue listening to our podcast, we will try and release maybe one or two more before the school year kind of starts. Um, but because we are planning on hosting sessions, um, we might just put a, our podcast on hold and on the back burner until like um, we hear otherwise that sessions get canceled or whatnot. Um, but aside from that, you'll be hearing from our club executives very soon in terms of how signups will happen and like uh, what the sessional hours will be like, membership costs and all that great stuff. So until then, that is just